and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and with me, as always, is my lovely co-host, la 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 limiter Lou. So let me ask you, have we have we hit a limit, you and I? Do we still have much to go? Yeah, because I was talking about, together? when I was talking about limiters, I was talking about the limits between our friendship, not not the limiters that we use in our computers. <laughs> right, yes. I just, I, just want, I just want to make sure that we still have a future together, DK. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> there's this comedian. There's this comedian. He's like, love is so strange because uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher the the joke. But he's like, love is so strange because when you're playing football, you don't have to s- sit back and remind each other that you're still playing football. You know, and when you're in a relationship, you have to continuously remind each other you love each other. You know, like. <laughs> It's like, oh, you still love me, right? Yeah, yeah, we love each other. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure because I couldn't tell from all of the, from all of the gift giving and the the sex that we've been having that we love each other, you know. <laughs> it's like when when you scream my name, I just wonder if you're thinking of somebody else's name. Maybe yeah. we have the same name. <laughs> yeah, dude. So yes, we're still playing football, Lou. We're okay, still playing great, fo- great. football. We're still playing football. Wait, European or American? Okay, shut up. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyway, uh, this episode is an interesting one. I'm hoping that it's going to be a quick one. It's probably not going to be because there's a lot of nuance in everything in life, especially when we talk when we talk about it. All right, but here's the deal: we're talking about mixing, specifically. The wording is mastering, or sorry, we're talking about mastering, mastering basics for mix engineers, mastering basics for mix engineers. Okay, here's the thing. We've all heard about a mastering chain, what mastering is. Some of us may consider it to be black magic. And it might as well be, because you have no idea what the fuck you're doing when you try to master. So it feels like black magic. And guess what? We're here to explain it a little bit for you. Hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. And uh, guess what? We have a mastering engineer right here. Hey. Lou. Hey. Braden from Flint Mastering is also a mastering engineer. I oh, mean, yeah. obviously, but he's not here with us today. But he's in the exclusive episodes. Braden! He's in the exclusive episodes. If you want to hear Braden talk about mastering, just go to mixedmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive to get access to all the exclusive episodes, making it three times the amount of episodes every single week for it's Braden. Okay, here it is. So, mastering. This evil art. And before we get into it, let me give myself a little bit of credibility here. I, I'm, I, uh, uh, Lou is a mastering engineer, does a lot of mastering, also does some mixing as well, right? Um, I'm a mix engineer through and through, but <laughs> due to some unfortunate and bad experiences, I, I, I will openly admit that I prefer to master my own mixes. How dare you? Also, and it's not being said on any other mastering engineer, this is just a personal preference. It's from trauma that I'm unable to cope with, okay? <gasps> Number two, although Lou does master some of my records, so that, that, that does once happen. Once in a while, yeah. yeah. Number two, um, I also get hired for just mastering standalone by itself. Actually, mostly from like my corporate label work, like my label work where I have like managers and stuff. That's actually... Um, that is actually mostly master from one of one of the companies I actually do mostly mastering, which is which is really oddly interesting. But we're not going to get into that now. Now we're going to get into what is mastering. What is mastering? Is it a chain? No. Is it a lifestyle? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's chain that you wrap around your neck. It's, it's the ego that you walk around, knowing that you're better than every other mixing engineer out there. It's the, it's the dick that you sling over your shoulder every morning as you talk to your model wife. <laughs> my wife is a model. That's no joke. A model That's in my eyes. Master engineer is. <laughs> That's what it takes to be a mastering engineer. My favorite description of a mastering engineer I've ever heard is it's usually the older guy in the room that just somehow didn't quit. And I was like, I'm not old. There's there's typically oh, there's typically two scenarios where a mastering engineer is is made or or someone gets into mastering. One specialty. They train with under a mastering engineer. Uh, to master and all they know is mastering they don't have any experience mixing they just master a lot of the old school mastering engineers do this a lot of them they're fantastic super fantastic another is transition the second um, is they were mixing they were producing um, and then they found themselves in a position where uh, they're getting thrown a lot of records for mastering because they have what 
they've built a brand about having a better ear or better understanding about audio. And they kind of like, oh my gosh, wow, I'm going to get into mastering. They kind of get into it. Lou, I think you're part of that, right? Uh, that does Kind happen. of, yeah. Like uh, my experience with mastering was like, I actually couldn't take on any more mixing work due to busyness. Um, so I was Scaling. oddly, yeah, I was honestly like transitioning more into mastering to be able to help uh, more people. Like, hey, if you have somebody else mix it, I'm willing to kind of look at it as like a final stage. Uh, you can send me the instrumental in acapella and I can do like a basic stem master if that. Um, or you can honestly just have me master the, the mix uh, and just kind of be like your personal final ear. You yeah. know, if that's what you're looking for. And then oddly enough, you know, I ended up working with a lot of bigger names and now I pretty consistently do some pretty well established engineers mix uh, masterings. There you go. Yeah. So there you go. So one is training. And in that sense, I don't think either of us have like, I don't I haven't spent a decade working under Gavin Lurson or something like that. You know, mm. that that's uh, that's that's um, one way of getting into it. You working, you know, assisting at Sterling Sound or something like that. That's one way of getting into it. But we're talking about mastering, not being a mastery engineer. So let's get into it. So mastering, uh, I'm going to tell you right now as a mix engineer, in an ideal world, in an ideal world, I want to do a mix that I spend a lot of time on that I love and I and I every part of it is intentional. Maybe we've done a, a dozen revisions with the A&R, with the client, with the artist, a dozen revisions. I spent a lot of time, a lot of emotional energy went into this mix. Best case scenario for a mastering engineer is I want to put a limiter on it and have it not change anything other than just be louder. That is the best case scenario for me and that's that is only the best case scenario when you're a damn good mixer in most cases i have a, i have a i don't ever take on students but this person was recommended to me by jonah who's mm -hmm. a good friend of ours and <clears throat> he wanted to learn about the basics of mastering you know i was like you know what fuck it whatever we'll do it let's do it and uh what we're talking about mostly is mixing <laughs> it's because at the end of the day if your mastering is not good and 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 <laughs> you need a big change from mix to master, then it's probably not mastering you need. You need more mixing. Now, mastering can give you a big change, but that's not professionally the intention. I'll, I'll put it that way. There is creatively an intention there. And sometimes you, as a mastering engineer, you might actually get hired for that. And so you might have clients that are looking specifically for that. Just like how you have a mixing engineer where somebody might send you the stems and be like, I want exactly this that we have just cleaner, you know. Um, and then there are people that hire people like DK where DK is much more on the creative side of mixing where it's like, hey, I'm sending it to DK because I want DK to do his thing too. Yeah, because I say, fuck your rough mix. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a mastering engineer doesn't always say, fuck your mix. And in fact, most times, if he, they ever do, they're just not hired again. Um, with that said, there are ways to tonally shape it in ways that can enhance maybe transience while maintaining loudness. There are ways to actually, you know, maybe shape the tones to be a little less harsh if that's kind of what the mastering engineer is kind of listening to. But at the end of the day, it's more about actually retention of the mix. And that's kind of the biggest challenge when people are understanding the basics of mastering. A lot of people ask me, like, how do you master a song? It's like, well, it starts with a good mix. Like, you can't look at mastering as the last 10%. You got to look at it as the last 2% because that 2% change is very Or even, even the additional 2%. Yeah, exactly. It's a very audible difference when you're the one that's worked on it a thousand times. But it's a very inaudible difference when you're a consumer listening to it for the first time. Oh, okay, so hold on. I want to actually, with that metaphor, I want to be extra specific on it. Sure. Okay, so I believe that mixing and mix engineers need to take the song, not to 98%, but to 100%. Yeah. It's done. It is done. And you send it out to, to um, DSPs if you want to, right? Here's the deal. A great mastering engineer doesn't take, will not take my song from 98% to 100%. They take a song from 100% to 101%, to 102%. They didn't, they didn't need it, 
But then you know there's like this mystical, magical thing. And if you weren't able to get to 100%, then you're doing a disservice to the mastery engineer and doing a disservice to the master in general. Because most of the time, if you want a loud, punchy master, it comes from a great mix. Like a lot of times, uh, it's kind of funny. Everybody talks about like, oh, do you do like fine point EQs or moving frequencies? I'm like, well, that depends. There could be a resonant frequency on purpose. You know, there might have been a synth that resonated at one note and that note was part of the music. So if you're looking at mastering as correcting the mix, you're not necessarily looking at it right because you're supposed Mm, to communicate that back to the actual engineer so that they can correct it. They have a much more, uh, I guess you could say, fluid way of correcting it, which is go directly to the stem that's problematic um, versus applying a general change to the overall blend of everything. Let's say that the frequency wasn't an issue for the reverb. You just took it away from the reverb through taking it out of the master. You know, um, you're actually doing general destructive changes in a master than you are in a mix. You know, so with that notion in mind, mastering is not about a chain. You can have a chain that you like, and in fact, I do. And in fact, I'll tell everybody what it is. It's invisible limiter into fire the clip into Fab Filter Pro uh, L2. But all of them are set to default. It as in they're not doing jack shit. Uh, They do whatever I tell it to do. But I do like that chain. I've noticed that it works for me. But if you notice, they don't have any tonal characteristics outside of transient shaping through limiting and clipping. Um, At no point did I mention any cue or saturation of some form outside of the clipper. But even the clipper, I like it to be as inaudible as possible. Reason being is if I can push it a little more and that's all it needs... Chances are that that's all the client wanted. I have one client that's very specific. I, if I take half a decibel out um, at, let's say, 500 hertz, he will email me back telling me, hey, you took 500 hertz out. <laughs> Why did you take 500 hertz out? It's like, I thought it was a little boxy. It's like, okay, I sent you a new mix with less of 500 hertz. Please do what you did but on that and don't take more <laughs> of that intense. 500. That is intense. Yeah, and then I'm telling you. I feel that way, but I I've had clients it. that tell me like, hey, can you boost 5K.3 with this specific plugin? Um, and that's totally cool. That's wild. That's yeah. wild though, but yeah. Yeah, but to me it's, it's like. It's cool because you're a cool person. That's not cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I'll be honest, like at the end of the day, my clients are happy. And that's that's, that's imp- no matter what business you're in, that's no matter what type of engineer, your clients are happy. Whether they want major changes or whether they want no changes. Okay. Uh, in DK's case, no changes are better. Yeah. Even if it is louder, if he can hear it, it's too much. Yeah. Because here's the thing. Most most limiters are not fully transparent. No. Okay. Um. So I want to say this. Okay. We talked a little bit about mastering for other people and what it's like being a mastering engineer. Let's talk about mastering your own mixes. Now, this is important. This is interesting. First questions first. This is the question that I always get. Do I do it in the same session? For me, this is up to you and whatever it takes to get into the mindset. The important answer to this question is that you have to do whatever it takes to look at your mix objectively and in a new light. So if that means stepping away for a day, putting it, bouncing it and putting it in a totally different session, maybe in a different DAW, if that's what it takes, um, Go ahead and do that. Because the point is, you need to be objective. You need to look at it with a clear, clear ears, clear mind, be able to look at it, okay? Which is really difficult to do if you've produced it, if you wrote the song, you're singing the song and doing all this stuff. It's really difficult to do, um, genuinely. Um, So that's why most of the time people hire out for mastering specifically. But if you're going to commit to doing it yourself, take the time away from the computer, take the time away from the song, whatever it takes. For me, when I mix a song... I master in the same session. I just use the mix bus. Everything goes to the mix bus and I put my my stuff on the mix bus. And sometimes, uh, recently I'm in a phase where I do almost nothing. Um, but there's been times in my career where I do a lot and I like take up like almost eight to 10 inserts, eight to 10 of the inserts, you know. Uh, but uh, now like I almost do anything. I don't do anything. I re- rarely do anything. Um, it's just kind of phases. I'm trying different things out, trying different tools. That's just how I work. Uh, with... Um, 
We're going to take a quick break to let you know that this episode has been brought to you by Tegler Audio based out of Berlin. Tegler makes fantastic analog pieces of equipment. Everything from compressors, both tube, VCA as well, from reverbs to recording channel strips to tube summing mixers and to my favorite piece that I personally own and have and use is the Schwarcraft machine, which is digitally controlled compression, 11 different types of compressor. I mean, this thing is built to the brim with tubes and transformers it's fantastic they have digitally controlled analog gear which i'm a huge huge fan of they've got two different pieces of that they've got 500 series gear so whether you're a tracking engineer a mixing engineer or a mastering engineer you need to check out this high quality company tegler and guess what their prices they're not they're not crazy they're mid-range prices for high-end equipment they're like a fantastic company. We love them so much. And if you want 10% off any of their gear, you can go to their website directly or from their shop directly, or I'll link it in mixingmusicpodcast.com slash Tegler, T-E-G-E-L-E-R, and use the code MMPOD to get 10% off your next order. Now back to the show. But I do it in the same session. Lou, when you, uh, when you master your own mixes, how do, you, how do you go about it? Is there any other tips that you recommend? Um, mentality wise so i don't listen to a song for a day or two at all That's the i best don't thing. i don't allow myself to hear it um i know that my clients might hear it and send me revision requests and that's totally cool i might do that revision request and then still not listen to it for another day um but i always let the client know like hey once you approve the mix and i move on to mastering it's going to be about a day or two and they're always kind of confused like you can't do it today it's like i just want to hear it objectively or i should hire somebody else um the reason being is that once you've heard something a million times for a day, um, certain things just become embedded in what you're hearing and they are not necessarily problematic anymore. It's kind of like when you take um, a uh, high shelf EQ, right? And you start rolling off the low end only to find resonance in the mid range that you didn't notice before because the low end is so prominent that it kind of masked the resonance in the mid range. Um, but if you start taking that resonance out, of the mid-range and you take that high pass off the mid-range for some reason now just feels a little hollow chances are that sounds cool on a fresh listen but if you were listening to it all on the same day and that resonance is something that's just been poking you in the ear all day and you start taking it out and you listen to the next day and somehow your master sounds more hollow than the mix then it's because you didn't give yourself a chance to listen to it objectively you know, so I try to remove myself for like a day or two, and then I do it on a separate session. Reason being is that a master will not affect the mix. If you listen to it in two days and there's an issue with the mix, go back to the mix. It's not ready for mastering. Amen. Yeah. Now, with that said, let's say that you like it and you just feel like, oh, okay. Um, I feel like it can use a flourish, but I don't hear it on a specific track. Then some master bus processing into mastering is a good idea and at that point that there's the 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 talk about the difference between master bus processing and mastering because there are tonal changes that you can make before a master you know you could put some saturation on your master bus you could throw a compressor on it if you feel like it needs a little more glue and you think like an ssl g bus might do the trick and you try it out and you do it and then great you know what that did the trick but that's not mastering that's just master bus processing that's just doing a general change to the mix um Mastering might be where you're actually going in and actually saying, you know what, I like the blend of the top end and everything. It's just a little bit chirpy together. Maybe the hi-hat and the clap snapping at the same time is just clashing with each other. But I like where each one of them is tonally, but it, it just when they do it together, it just kind of clips a little bit in a way that I just don't like the way it, maybe I just don't like the way it's saturating. Um, maybe you put a multiband uh a compressor or a dynamic EQ in that range on on your master track and you know you do just a little dip there and maybe it puts it into pocket you know mastering is more about the idea of getting it to translate once you listen to it on different systems rather than it is about making it sound better objectively on one set of speakers in one room to one person you know that's why in my studio um if you guys have AirPod Pros or AirPod Maxes, I'm a 
teach you a little trick real quick. If you use a uh, sound reference ID or sound ID reference, whatever it's called, um, you can set up your AirPods to sync up with the software wirelessly. You don't need a cable to plug into your interface or anything. And when you click on that profile, it automatically transmits the audio from your DAW to your headphones. Um, so you can use sound reference ID and you can use their calibrations if you want. I don't because nobody else is going to listen to it in the real world with sound ID reference turned on on their AirPod Maxes. But that gives me a much better idea of what it's going to sound like in my AirPod Maxes when I leave the studio, in my AirPod Pros when I leave the studio, in some Audio Technicas, uh, some Bayer Dynamics that I have. Uh, when I go to my car, what is it going to sound like there? And the the cool thing is, like, if you have a way of referencing in multiple locations, uh, sources, I guess you could say, um, in your studio, that's where mastering really exists. It's about translation on different mediums, whether it be Spotify, Tidal, your headphones, your car, whatever. Um, as much as you can reference on different sources in your studio, that's more related to mastering than, you know, the Studio A800 being on your master bus. There you go. Okay. So what is mastering for a mix engineer standpoint or, or doing it all for yourself? Honestly speaking, um, maybe a little bit of glue, maybe a little bit of overall EQ, but honestly, the most important thing is just loudness. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <clears> to <throat> break some brains here for you real quick. How loud do you want your masters? The loofs. Break it down for me. Have you heard minus 14? Have you heard minus 12? Are you asking me if I've listened to a song and been like, yep, that's definitely numerically minus no, 14? No, no, no. I mean, no, I'm sorry. That was, that was uh, rhetoric questions <laughs> yeah. here, right? Rhetorical questions. Uh, have you heard that that's what you're supposed to do? Have you heard that you're supposed to do minus 10? Have you heard that you're supposed to do minus 9? Here's the deal. Here's my belief. And I think this goes into how to get it to sound the best um, and how to make your client happy as well as how to make the platforms happy. In my opinion, and this is from lots of experience, you get that motherfucker as loud as you possibly can without hurting it. And if that means minus five LUFS, you get that bitch to minus five LUFS. Yeah. Now, most of the time, most of, and this is all based on like mixing skill too, because if you're really good at mixing and you've been able to do the work of properly uh, controlling dynamics while you're mixing, it's really easy to get it. It's easier to get a mix at minus five LUFS. And this is where the skill part comes in, right? But here's the thing. Most songs can't handle, most mixes can't handle minus five LUFS. You can't handle the minus five. It starts to break up. So now yeah. you have to do minus seven. I actually just had to master an album where it's almost all low end 808s booming in the mix. And it doesn't sound bad. Like that's the vibe. It's like West Coast G Funk style kind of stuff. Um, but I can only get it to minus 10 without distortion. So at that point, like if the conversation becomes, I want it louder, it's like, Okay, are you comfortable with distorting the mix a little bit? There you go. And that that you probably could have gotten louder if you mixed it or if, if the mix was a little bit less dynamic. Because yeah. that's just that's just dynamics. A lot of folk songs, jazz and classic and even folk and that kind of music. Uh, less compression. It's going to be dynamic. It's actually going to be closer to the minus 12, minus 14. In fact, with cinematic music, minus 14 is a great way of putting it. Because yeah. you want those loud, lowy, boof, to be short-term minus 14 at the loudest. Yeah. At the loudest. So um, that's very important. Um, to bring dun, up. Dun. So, I'm just um, thinking of the, those, uh, those great, great drums. So I'm also thinking just like set expectations with whoever your artist or manager is. But in general, yeah. if there are no expectations. You want to go as loud as possible. Literally, I was, uh, this is a student I had a year ago. Shout out to, uh, my boy Pixel. Pixel. And, uh, he, uh, literally we were talking about this. And he's like, the label keeps getting me revision requests and something like that. I don't, I think that was the story. And I was like, dude, mix sounds good. I'm going to take a long shot here and let's, let's risk another revision to find out if all of this convoluted messages and revisions that they're asking for, which I think are ridiculous, just means louder. What I have them do is I have them send the next master couple like minus two lufs louder than the previous version mm -hmm. like two lufs louder than the previous version instant approval instant approval and in most cases 
and working, I don't want to say corporate, that's not the right word, but working with um, companies, with labels, with libraries, with anything of the sort, almost always, unless it's really classical cinematic stuff, louder is always better. Yeah. Very rarely. And if, and I would even go as far as to always just assume that that's an always rule, like a hundred percent rule. And then the one time they're like, actually, this is, this is the type of music we want dynamic. That's a revision. That's okay. Like, okay, okay, cool. I can back off on this one. Sweet. But louder is always better. If you can get that bitch to minus two, minus Mm -hmm. three LUFS without hurting the mix at all, which is like very rare. Like that's an almost impossible. I've done minus 2.5, but it's because it was a metal mix. I've done, I've done minus four at, I think the loudest. It was like maybe been minus 4.5. So it was like closer to minus five. Was it kind of like one of those like lo-fi-ish kind of mid-range? It was, it was, it was digicore. Ah, just like, yeah. like really distorted digital. Wait, was that for um, Ben Dragon? No, 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 no. This no, I know, else. I know. He wanted his stuff loud. I think we were at like minus six one when, when you were working on his. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't remember that's so long ago too. Yeah. But anyway, um, it was some Digigore stuff. It was actually this last week, this couple of weeks ago. Anyway, um, I'll show you later. But uh, um, yeah, this is this is a real thing. Get it as loud as possible. Here's the thing. <laughs> This is why I love being on a podcast and YouTube. The YouTube channel is secondary to the podcast is because on YouTube, all these influencers and these teachers, they want views, they want clicks, they want subscribers. And in order to get subscribers, there are topics and things that you say that follow the mainstream understanding that gets clicks and views and subscribers. One of those things is talking about the truth about mastering and why how to really get good masters and then saying things like keep it at minus 12 for someone that doesn't know better that's that's a great advice sure whatever here's the deal or they want to look like they know what they're talking about so they talk about all the dsp back end and how normalization works and they might actually know what they're talking about but actually impracticality minus 12 or whatever where spotify doesn't doesn't dock it you know but you get it on spot they get on spotify and you're like oh actually it's still way quieter than everything else because nobody else gives a crap and like the loudness to docking is actually not symmetrical all the way down it's not uniform all the way down anyway these are things that we're telling you the great thing about being a podcast is that we don't give a shit about clicks do you remember a shit about views we can say whatever the fuck we want because podcast viewers and listeners care less about anyway go ahead do you remember when uh uh, it was eric that uploaded the the instagram reel of the master class that i did on uh mixing Mm -hmm. and there were questions about mastering and about what loudness to go for and i specifically said you know there is no one loudness to rule them all it's just (laughs) whatever the client's happy with and at the end of the day there is a situation where for any given client, it could be one file to rule them all. You know, uh, you'll hear how some labels ask for deliverables like a Spotify specific mix, an iPod, uh, iTunes uh, specific mix, or I guess that's Apple Music nowadays. Um, maybe, I don't know, it's usually between Spotify and Apple that they want like mastered for iTunes and things of that nature. Um but I had mentioned, like, just focus on getting it as loud as you can, because if they only have one file to turn in, then, you know, if they're going to dock it, they're going to dock it. But when they go to sell that same file on a CD or they're just sending it off for consideration for playlists and all that, and it comes out quieter because you sent them the Spotify minus 14 version and they're listening and trying to consider, oh, do I want to play this in the club? But it's actually quieter than everybody else's track. They're not going to play it. Like, unfortunately, you know, just try to get it as loud as you can and let the docs happen. Like, unfortunately, not everybody can afford to have every alternative version. Not everybody has access to upload every alternative version to every distributor. Um, So when people are like, oh, you know, you have to do this for Spotify. Yeah, we we get it. To be honest, to be 100% honest, the people making more money than you uh, in the industry likely don't care and aren't really putting that as a priority so here's the thing there's probably a lot of like true to the core mastery engineers that may be listening that may be upset and that's cool yeah, this that's this fine. episode is for people that are trying to just get their records out yeah here's the thing as long as you do it yourself it's it's at the end of the day like call me out if anything i, I no, welcome no, no, no. it hold, hold, hold. i was gonna say at the end of the day putting one or two limiters on your master bus 
and turning up the volume is still going to be a better master than having it go through any sort of lander or AI mastering. <laughs> Just I put a limiter on it. That's all you need to do. So I actually had a client uh, two months ago that sent me a record. He's like, hey, I had this uh, song I wanted you to master. Um, uh, just out of curiosity, I'm wondering if you can get it louder than this. And he sends me a master, and it has like dot lander or something like that. I forget how it codes the, the title of the song. And I was like, oh, you use lander. It's like, no, this is a friend of mine. I was like, they use lander. And he's like, I don't understand. What's lander? Um he got paid to do a AI master. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, he got paid got and caught. his friend ran it through Lander. Um and, and didn't I'm not, even bother to change the name to hide it. Yeah. So the the reason this is funny to me is because like their one complaint was that it wasn't loud enough um and that it changed too much of the mix. So I listened to the mix. It sounded fine. Um there was maybe like a little bit of resonance around like 1K, 1.5K, usually in, in those kind of like weird mid-rangey pokey tones. Um, just did like a little dynamic EQ and then threw a limiter on it and comes back and he's like, dude, I freaking love it. This is the best master I've ever heard. I'm like, dude, I barely did jack shit. And that's not to say that mastering engineers barely do jack shit, but there's a time and place when you know that you don't really need to do anything. And that's part of what you're paying for. Exactly. And I think that's a great place to end the episode is understanding that then what are you paying a mastering engineer for? Then what is a high-level mastering engineer? And a high-level mastering engineer knows exactly when too loud is too loud, when yeah. it's not worth sacrifice everything. They know how to do just enough to find the peak performance as far as volume goes and, and get to the point of diminishing returns where they can push it louder, but at the sacrifice of what? And they're yeah. able to understand that. They're able to understand what the best they could do with the song and when to pull back. I mean, have you seen Mix with the Masters? There's a couple of mastering engineers out there, <laughs> videos that are on YouTube, and all they do is like maybe half a dB of EQ here in one spot and then an L2 and then it's done. It's yeah. done. That's it. That's all they did. A good one to watch is the Kendrick Lamar damn one, uh, where he's like, you know, Mixed by Ali already had it pretty loud, so it wasn't a matter of like pushing it or over compressing anything. He's like, I just ran it through a few simple things, and he walks through his process, and yeah, sure enough, it's very simple, minute changes, which anybody that's seen my master classes know that I'm a, I'm a big believer in minor changes make big results. Um, yeah, that that album was mastered under the most simplistic ways, but with such precision thought that it made a difference. It, it, it was the thought behind it, not the amount of processing put onto it. I will say the highest earning skill in this industry is knowing when not to do something. Yeah. That skill makes the most amount of money and is worth paying the most amount of money for. That's why you notice the higher up you go, the the higher up you go in, um, up the chain of mixers and mastering engineers, the less and less they end up doing. Or yeah. it feels like they sound like they do less and less and less. Um, even if it's super it's complicated, better. but it doesn't sound like the difference is very minute. Yeah. And here's the, here, that's the secret. It really is. And it, and it takes a real sincere noob to fuck it up by doing too much. Oh, yeah. It takes a noob to do that. So don't be noobs. Just put a limiter on it. Whatever. Don't do anything else. Uh, maybe an EQ, maybe a saturation. May try some things. I always recommend experimenting and finding out and bypassing and finding out if it actually made it better. But take the time to be intentional and to learn from your intentions and to try things out. If you love this podcast, if you're a longtime fan, please... Go to Spotify, rate it five stars. If you listen on Google or on Apple Podcasts or any other platform, please rate it five stars and leave a couple words in the reviews. The five stars alone helps us, but if you leave five stars with a little a sentence, maybe one sentence, maybe two words, maybe one word, yeah, that's enough <laughs> for us to be boosted in the algorithm to be shared with many other people. We appreciate it. And it's because of people and viewers, listeners like you, that we get to... <laughs> Sorry, little get my PBS, PBS. voice out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, we're, we're funded by listeners like you. You know, yeah, you know uh, and, and just, just do that. Just give us a little love. We do that. We appreciate that. Also, if you're interested in listening to more content, you know, go to mixingmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive for exclusive episodes of the Mixing Music Podcast. Join us. We have lots and lots of awesome listeners and we have great content Three times the amount of content, actually, if you go listen to the exclusive episodes.
And we've been releasing the archive versions every Thursday as well from a year ago, from over a year ago. Yes, we've been doing it that long. Um, lots, you get access to the whole library. You can just binge it all. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. We love you very much. Happy mixing, my friends. And stay saucy. <laughs> <laughs>